Hello and welcome to the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. In this episode, I will be talking to Tom Kirkham, founder and CEO of Iron Tech Security, about cybersecurity defense systems for engineers and how engineering firms can secure their businesses against ransomware attacks by establishing a security-first environment. I am your host, Jeff Perry, founder of More Than Engineering, and I help engineers and technology professionals with leadership and career coaching to create meaningful careers and lives. And this is the Engineering Career Coach Podcast, brought to you by EMI. This is the first podcast dedicated to helping engineers and technical professionals with both their personal and professional development. Before we get started, I just wanna mention that this is a free show and our sponsors help us to keep it free. So I would now like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, Washington State University. Washington State University's global campus offers a high value online educational experience in engineering and technology management. The ETM program offers a master's degree and graduate certificates in specialty areas like industrial leadership and supply chain management. Courses provide technical professionals with the knowledge, tools, and skills to manage projects, operations, organizations, and people. The program is tailored for professionals who want to advance their careers while still working full-time. ETM faculty and staff are accessible and personable from first contact through graduation. The program is well recognized and provides courses taught by faculty with industry experience. Live interactive learning provides industry relevant content, giving students immediately applicable skills. Engineering and technology management, an advanced degree for an advanced workforce. Accelerate your career and reach out today. Now it's time to jump right into the main segment of the episode. Tom, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Welcome. As we get started here, I'd love to hear in your own words to to tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what life looks like for you on a daily basis. What are you up to? Oh, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have any opportunity I can get to spread the gospel, (laughs) so to speak, when it comes to cybersecurity. But about me, that the bio doesn't really capture, is I've been in technology in every facet one can imagine for 40 years. Investor, business owner, software design, network administration, cybersecurity, of course, and and just all facets of it. And I've been dealing with small to medium-sized businesses and Fortune 10 companies throughout during all of those years when it comes Mm -hmm. to technology. So I approached this from not only the, the technical knowledge, the skills, but also the business relationship, understanding what risk businesses have when it comes to cybersecurity or what risk they have when choosing software to run their business. Uh, But these days it's all about evangelizing cybersecurity. Absolutely. Okay. So, so let's hear about this. We're going to dive into cybersecurity and how important this is where a lot of us, maybe we're, we're focused when we're talking about engineers here, maybe we're focused on other areas of engineering. Cybersecurity isn't something that we might think a lot about. So just to start here, maybe the first thing that a lot of people would think about is antivirus software or something like Mm -hmm. that on their computers. Right. So, but, but you might say that, we need to go beyond that. So what's wrong with just having some antivirus protection? Well, it, it, it's just not effective anymore. The times have changed, and they changed dramatically when our government's NSA, National Security Administration, was breached, and their offensive cyber weapons are available on the dark web to download by criminals in other nation states, and they're be- literally being used against us every single day. Hmm. So remember the Stuxnet virus that we used to attack Iran's nuclear enrichment facility? Okay. It was designed to spin the centrifuges up past their operational limits, so they just self-destructed. Well, that very virus or Trojan or whatever you want to classify it as is being modified and being used against us. And, and there's other nation states, you know, the, the greatest cyber offensive weapons that are available are available to all hackers Interesting. and, and okay. criminal hackers. And those, that changed the stakes. No longer 
can you rely on an antivirus signature file to detect a virus code? And to put a finer point on that, in the case of ransomware attacks, which is the worst thing right now, mm -hmm. uh, there is no virus to detect a signature in a modern day ransomware attack. There is no virus. Every single part of that storyline, that's an actual term in the infosec or cybersecurity business, we want to know what's the storyline of the attack. You know, mm -hmm. who's the threat actor? What's the threat technology? What was the attack vector? On and on and on. Well, the storyline of a basic ransomware attack is something like this. It typically gets delivered via email. They con the victim or psychologically manipulate them, social engineer them, how, whatever fancy words you want to use, but it's a con job. Mm -hmm. They create a sense of urgency. Maybe it appears to be from a vendor saying you have unpaid invoices. Attached is a spreadsheet. Please pay immediately or your services will be cut off. So they're conned into opening an Excel spreadsheet. Well, then the Excel spreadsheet calls a macro. The macro calls the Windows disk encryption, mm. and it begins encrypting all the files. Nowhere in there is there a virus. It's all built into Microsoft Office and Microsoft Windows. So there's no virus to detect. So modern ransomware attacks completely bypass antivirus. They don't even know they're there. Hmm. And then they deliver multiple payloads. They typically, the attackers typically install server backdoors. They put key loggers on and other malware that can be exploited by other specialists in the days, weeks, months, or even years ahead. Okay. Well, I'm appropriately terrified. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so... <laughs> Basically what you're saying, there's a lot more to consider here because like you said, the stakes have changed, the game has changed, and the, the strategies and things that, that people are using are just things that basic tools that we've had in the past just, just can't deal with. So when we're thinking about this from an individual level or maybe from an organizational level, um, maybe you might classify this into different roles or responsibilities. A lot of times a, a company will have an IT information technology group, but how would you differentiate information technology from information security and how we take care of that? Because, I mean, we are hearing of data breaches that are shutting down companies or, or getting customer information out where it seems like every week we're hearing about public things in the news, and I'm sure that happens more on a private basis than we even hear about. So how do we think about these things a little bit differently? Uh, well, that's, that's, that's a great a uh, bunch of questions. Let me unpack that a Sorry, little bit. Yeah. Let's let's start with the sheer scale of the problem. Mm -hmm. The 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 JBS and the Colonial Pipelines. You know, we have two or three of those a year that hit CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, and everybody knows about them. Sure. And it's four or five or ten or twenty million dollar ransomware demands. The vast majority of ransomware attacks are five and ten thousand dollar ransom demands. They are sent out in volume. They're done at scale. They're automated hacking, automated attacks. They don't know who you are. They don't care who you are. They're playing a numbers game. Mm -hmm. So let's say you blast out an uh, email. You blast out this attack to 100,000 engineers across the nation. Maybe it's 100,000 electrical engineers or civil engineers. It doesn't really matter. It could be doctor's offices, it could be accounting, financial, it could be anything, wherever the list comes from. And you, and you hopefully have done your marketing and you understand that the firms you're attacking are sizable and that are, they can afford these types of ransoms. Mm -hmm. So if you send out 100,000 emails and just have a 1% conversion, the criminal has a 1% conversion, that's 1,000 people that they're collecting an average ransom of $10,000 a piece from all automatically calculated by, I might add. It, it goes out, some of it can go out and scan the network. Oh, there's five computers here, we'll ask for 5,000. Oh, there's 50, we'll ask for a cool million. And it's all done on the fly. There's not somebody behind a keyboard going to uh, Bill and Ted's engineering firm 
sure. and and saying, "Oh, I hate Bill, and we're just going to get twenty or twenty thousand out of Bill." That's it, that's not the way it works. It's done at scale. It's automated bots, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's part of the problem. And then you touched upon uh, going to IT, and that's historically been it been what it was. The problem with IT being responsible for your security, it's not in their wheelhouse, really, especially since the game changed. Okay. You know, you've got to have advanced, uh, it's a class of product called EDR instead of antivirus. You can't buy that off the shelf. If you can't, if you can buy, or any security you buy off the shelf is simply not good enough these days. You've got to have this EDR, and it's got to be backed up by InfoSec professionals monitoring and responding and remediating and mitigating threats. Mm-hmm. But I understand why everybody thinks of it as an IT. That's where you go, right? Sure. If you Maybe your firm outsources to an IT company, and, and it's a great way to do it. It's an MSP. But IT is and always has been, and I believe – should be concentrating their efforts on increasing the firm's productivity, mm-hmm. their efficiency, make sure they don't go down, minimize frustration, minimize help desk uh, calls. They're, it's a bottom line focused, and that's the way it's always been. Mm-hmm. And that's what they need to keep doing. If you look at InfoSec or cybersecurity objectives, they're different. So one of the things is risk analysis. Mm-hmm. You know, EDRs cost more than an antivirus. And, and by the way, the, everybody that listening to this can afford these advanced tools, okay? okay. They do cost more, but it, you've just got to have them. It's the cost of doing business anymore. But InfoSec or an, a managed security services provider like Iron Tech Security, we look at What's the risk to the client? Do they handle intellectual property? Is this could a community be impacted because this water main is not uh, installed in time, and they got a water shortage or wastewater problems, or is the highway being built, and you know mechanical engineering hitting deadlines? I mean, just go down the list, right? Mm-hmm. So, who's all the stakeholders? Who are the most likely threat actors? What technologies are going to be used against them? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're one of those firms that's using a managed services provider to run your IT, you will typically get a service level agreement. That means they promise to respond in a certain amount of time, and it's very typical to be four hours. Okay. A managed security service provider, four hours is an eternity when a, when a, a security anomaly or a security event, or an actual attack occurs. You've got to be Johnny on the spot. And it's a different way for those two different organizations to even think about it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a cultural thing in the company that when we see an alert, we not only do we orchestrate response, but we're backed up by hundreds, literally hundreds of InfoSec specialists around the world, our partner vendors. Mm-hmm. That they're Johnny on the spot in their security operations centers, and everybody's working together to coordinate, orchestrate the the uh, mitigation of the issue, or at least slow it down, so we can write some code or something to get back behind it. If this is if the automated tools fail, and so what. And so what you really need to think of those is not only being two different roles, but they're two different positions in your company. Hmm. Okay. And you need to go to security specialist for InfoSec or cybersecurity, and you need to go to IT to hit the bottom line. Now, of course, we affect the bottom line because if you you get a breach and destroy your reputation, you could be one of those uh, 60% that go out of business in two years because you had a breach. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a different focus, a different skill set. It would be something, probably not a good analogy, but it would be like going to a civil engineer if you need electrical engineering, you know, okay. or a heart surgeon if you need brain surgery. Yeah, they they truly are two different and and forward thinking leaders, company presidents, the ones that are visionary, 
are actually flipping that whole thing around. Mm -hmm. They're putting their security officer in charge of everything, and mm -hmm. IT is a bolt-on to security. And we're seeing that right now as we speak. That's the latest trend in our industry. You know, yeah. the Fortune 500 had already gotten to where they have a chief information officer and a chief information security officer, both direct reports to the CEO. But now they're flipping it. It's going full circle, and now IT's becoming a plug-in to the security officer because security needs to be job one. As a country, all industries have traded security for convenience and efficiency and productivity for decades, and now we're paying the price for it. Okay, interesting. So it sounds like you would definitely say that things really are as bad or perhaps much worse because we don't see those things like that we just hear on the news with some of the, we just like we talked about, we hear some of that big stuff. But the threat and the engagement and and the the reach of these security issues goes far beyond anything that we'd ever hear on the news. Would you, is that what you're you're trying to tell us? Oh, uh, absolutely. I and I could tell you stories, tell your audience stories that you well, they are frankly, literally unbelievable. You know, sure. it puts me in a tenfold hat uh, <laughs> uh, 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 situation, but I know that they're facts. I mean, it's, you know, this is the FBI, you know, write up on it. Mm. Are things really as bad or worse than what we're hearing on the news? And what, what we're yeah, they really are. And, to, to know. It, and it's not, it's not just the actual anomalies that we see that we know that it's bad. Mm -hmm. It's when you look at things from a technical perspective. So like take remote desktop access, right? You know, everybody's working from home from COVID, right? And everybody's remoting into their desktop or whatever. There's technology behind that. Sure. And we can look at routers and switches and see how many attempted attacks on the actual technology there are trying to, br trying to break into remote desktop. And in one mm -hmm. week in March of 2020, we saw a thousand percent increase on just our equipment, mm. but it affected all clients. Sure. And, and so it's relentless. It's literally hundreds of or thousands of times a minute that some way, somehow, we are under attack or our clients are under attack or your engineering firm is under attack. Mm -hmm. And once again, these are automated attacks. They're bots. They're looking for weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Colonial pipeline. I wasn't involved in that, the uh, investigation of it. Sure. But what it was was a virtual private network and, you know, a VPN. I, mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of your audience knows what a VPN is. And it was legacy. It was unused. And they did not have it protected by multi-factor authentication. You know, that okay. third piece of credentials that's time sensitive. It's only good for 30 or 60 seconds. Okay. So it was an old legacy connection hanging out there that was probably discovered by a bot. Mm -hmm. And then somebody picked it up and maybe the bot determined how many devices there were behind it. And that's about all the attackers really knew. And so then they started working it because it was a big enough target for them to manually hands-on breach Colonial Pipeline. One of the things that missed the headlines on CNN about that breach is they had no idea it was a petroleum distribution network. They just knew it was a fat target. Yeah. They actually apologized during the attack. Sorry, we didn't know we were disrupting petroleum distribution in a third of the nation there. Uh, it was still won our four and a half million dollars, but uh, sorry about that. Yeah. And, but it, and, and, and another thing about that colonial pipeline to emphasize how important it is to be to think security first. Mm -hmm. I really believe that that breach happened because Colonial at the time did not have a chief information security officer. Mm -hmm. Immediately after the attack, they began searching for one, and they probably have one now. Sure, uh, they that that is a, these old unused connections is something that a security officer is trained and experienced to keep an eye out for. Yeah. Okay. And in IT, once again, it's not part of their core objectives. Theirs is about productivity. Okay, nobody's using it. Who cares? Yeah. You know? so. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So, so as I think about it from the firm perspective um, or, or organization, 
you know, we're talking a lot about cybersecurity. In my mind, I went to, you know, is, is protecting all of this sort of like insurance, but also thinking there's probably cyber insurance too. So is, are, are there two different ways to, to kind of protect against, you know, protecting against, you know, defensive, but also that insurance is the fallback. So if something does get through, if something does happen, then you're also kind of protected um, in that way as well. So how would you, uh, w- w- what do you think about kind of taking both approaches there for a firm? Uh, well, uh, absolutely. Do both. Okay. However, we see so many businesses and other organizations that simply don't know what I'm talking about. They, 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 don't, they haven't been exposed to the five things. They don't realize that antivirus don't work. They don't realize they might be getting bad information from their IT people. Mm-hmm. Nothing against IT people. They make us better. We make them better. It's a team sure. effort. And, and while I'm on the subject, most of the times when we go into customers that have an outsourced IT company or even staff, they are relieved that the client went to an infosec company instead of to them because they know it's a different set of skills and mm-hmm. objectives and all of that yeah sure but getting back to insurance it it, it it people you know you you've got a insurance agent that it's just part of your annual deal say hey, well you ever thought about getting cybersecurity insurance and that's where they stop because they simply don't know what to do mm-hmm. Now, what's even more intriguing about cybersecurity insurance is we're seeing the underwriters require certain defense technology, certain administrative controls being in place, or they won't underwrite your policy, or your premiums are going to be outrageously expensive. Sure. And in fact, in those cases, we're seeing that it more than pays for the cost of the defense. Yeah. It's kind of like health uh, insurance and, and, you know, pre-existing conditions and stuff like that. And, and your current right. level of health is going to determine your, your life and health insurance premiums kind of a thing. It's no different than any other insurance sure. in that it's the last thing you want to rely on to make you whole. You mm-hmm. know, I, if I have a wiring problem in my old house here, I don't just blow it off because I've got homeowner's insurance. Sure. I'm going to call my electrician, my master electrician buddy, and he's going to come over here and fix it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like any other insurance, life insurance, homeowners, auto. It's it's you, you can't buy that insurance company will not buy your reputation back. Mm-hmm. And another problem with cybersecurity because the ground is literally moving under their feet so much and so fast they can't keep up. We're yeah. seeing uh, I'm seeing anecdotal. Uh, statistics that 20 to 49 percent of insurance cybersecurity insurance claims are going unpaid Hmm. because the applicant checked the wrong box Hmm. on the application okay well tom you've been doing this for a long time and i know you also wrote a book on the subject the cyber pandemic uh, cyber pandemic survival guide love to know a little bit more about the inspiration behind the book and, and what you feel like that is able to help people understand that are able to um, pick that up and read that? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question also. So, it, and, and I didn't come up with this, this thought. Uh, it was Klaus Schwab, who's the founder and CEO of the World Economic Forum, you know, the Davos group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they're, they're basically a global think tank. Sure. Uh, you know, first society's benefit, whatever you think about them politically, it doesn't really matter. But they, they really do, they're really visionary in what they think. And what Klaus did was say, take the COVID thing that we all experienced across the globe and imagine if that was a cyber attack that broke out and caused collateral damage. Mm-hmm. It would make, you know, COVID spent, weeks and months to, to spread around the planet. Mm-hmm. Well, if the Russians unleash and fail to contain one of their advanced cyber weapons that, uh, and they, they thought they were just attacking Ukraine, the last time they did this, by the way, it affected about a billion dollars of U.S. companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a billion dollar loss on it because it wasn't containable. And they did a full-scale attack on Ukraine four year, five, almost five years ago. Well, imagine that they do it this time in this 
incident that's going right now, and it's a really bad offensive cyber weapon that gets loose from Ukraine. Well, that is not going to be like COVID. That's going to be days, weeks, months. It's going to spread around the globe in almost the speed of light. Hmm. You know, it's going to be minutes and hours, and it's going to be a global phenomenon that could affect critical infrastructure. All 17 that President Biden enumerated, but it could affect your schools, your your hosp- well, hospitals is critical infrastructure. Look at uh, Ireland. They had a big ransomware attack in their whole public health system that they couldn't do surgeries, they couldn't do appointments for weeks. Wow. I mean, people's lives were at stake. Sure. And so the whole point of it is is to understand that this threat is real. I believe it's inevitable. I hope I'm wrong on that. But I, I, I just, not enough organizations, governments are putting the right defenses in place. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if everybody installed an EDR, you, ransomware would go away. That's it. You're immunized. Your company cannot get a ransomware attack if you've got that class of product in there. Mm. And so what I want to do, what my goal is with the book is to educate people how the smallest of incidences can escalate and spread all over the world. And instead of it being a town in Connecticut that can't put salt on the roads during a heavy snowstorm and they can't, uh, they can't deliver water to their customers. And that's a serious problem. You can't deliver water. Sure. You know, we've all, or many of us have experienced these rolling blackouts. You can go without electricity for a few hours. A friend of mine went out for five days, but he said, I had to have water. Mm -hmm. It's this cyber pandemic that that I'm thinking and others are are thinking we're perilously close to having. Mm -hmm. It's going to make COVID look like a minor setback, a minor aberration, Mm. a minor inconvenience. Yeah, interesting. And now I heard you mention something earlier about companies and firms understanding something you call the five things. Just curious if you can quickly uh, tell us what those five things are that we need to understand so that we can we can be aware of those. Sure. So Ann Newberger is the uh, she's the acting national deputy or na- the acting. Deputy National Security Advisor to the President. She's basically the one that it all goes through. Okay. You know, what's happening right now? What, what, what do we need to fear in the future? And advise the President on the specific executive orders and all the administrative things that go with the executive office. Mm-hmm. She has enumerated five things. And, and these five things, she just sent this letter out. It's an open letter. It's a three-page letter on White House letterhead. This is from the White House. It's addressed to business leaders. Okay. What we urge you to do to stop ransomware attacks. And it's five things. Any InfoSec specialist will tell you those are great. You do those things, you're, you, you know, the hackers are going to go somewhere else. They're not going to mm-hmm. waste any time on you. Okay. And uh, just real quickly... You got to have a skilled security team. That means monitoring and checking and responding, not just these automated tools. It's not do it yourself anymore, is what she's really saying. Mm-hmm. It's the days of going and buying Norton Antivirus or McAfee or whatever maybe an IT buddy told you was the best are over. Those are those are inadequate. You know, if I get called to testify in a case, did this attorney use reasonable efforts to protect this client data from the breach? and this attorney's not doing these five things, I'll have to say no. Hmm. Those were not reasonable efforts. They were negligent. Hmm. Okay, so anyway, back back to the five things, right? Skilled security team. <clears throat> Multi-factor authentication. You know, that third hmm. credentials, remote desktop, but turn it on everywhere. Mm-hmm. You can turn it on on your Amazon account. It doesn't cost anything. It's, it's, it's just right there ready for you to turn on. Mm-hmm. Facebook. Use it wherever you can. Deploy that endpoint detect and response category of product. This is what replaces your antivirus, and it uses artificial intelligence or a neural network to learn the behavior of existing and brand spanking new 
technical threats that it discovers and responds within seconds to protect other computers around the globe. Literally within minutes of, say, of our, a new technology being discovered in Tokyo, all of the products, I mean, all of the computers that are protected by that very product knows what to look for within minutes or even seconds because it's a neural net. Another thing, another one of the five is turn on disk encryption. All your devices, it, you know, laptops, tablets, that's obvious. You don't, you know, if you lose them, you want your data encrypted. But you need to turn it on on your servers, your desktops. Because you don't know what's going to happen to that equipment when you recycle it, you retire it, mm -hmm. you know, you resell it, whatever. And then the last of the five things, in no particular order, is you've got to have a way to stay up to, de uh, up to date on new and evolving threats. It may be geopolitical. It may be a new offensive cyber weapon that's been released. And you've got to incorporate this new threat info constantly, continuously, into your defense systems, which goes back to you've got to have a skilled security team. It is a fire hose of information, all the threats and the advisories and, and everything we get hit with every day. Okay. And, so, you're, uh, yeah. so, so you're saying business leaders should focus on business and, uh, and bring in these teams and put in the right, who will help them put the right things in place to take care of protecting the business and what they're doing. It, 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 it's way too important. The security, the very survival of your company, all of the employees' jobs are, uh, the employees themselves are at risk. All of your clients are at risk. You could have collateral damage. Uh, you know, your client data gets out, you know. Uh, and who knows what that that could could cause? It it is simply one of those things that it's it's time to hire the professionals. If you yeah. get involved with a lawsuit, you're not going to defend yourself as an engineer. You're going to hire an attorney. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a professional. It, and and it, the time has come that and it's not just me saying it, it's the White House. Sure. It's uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology that says it. Mm -hmm. And when you really get in and look at what best practices are for an engineering firm or any industry, really, yeah. when it comes to protecting it, <clears throat> you quickly see that these skill sets are not something you can just, you can learn as a hobbyist. It's, it, it's time to get the pros in. Okay, gotcha. Well, Tom, this has been very educational for me and I'm sure for many of our listeners. At this point, we're going to transition to the Take Action Today segment of the show. We'll get one final piece of actionable advice from Tom on how we can get a little bit more protection in our cyber cybersecurity lives. Now it's time for the Take Action Today segment of the show. Tom, We've, we've talked about a lot of different things and you've opened some eyes and, and ears around cybersecurity and how important this is. What's the one final piece of advice you would say to individual engineers or, or people in their companies and firms on action they can take to, to be, be safer and more protected given the environment that we're in right now? Well, do something. You know, the White House says you need a skilled security team. So just do that right, right off the bat and find a managed security services provider, okay? And then one of two things is going to happen. You're gonna to talk to an InfoSec specialist about five or 10 minutes, and we can quickly learn, if you're a smaller firm, doesn't have to go through a lot of decision-making process, you need the five things, we know that. Because if you have the five things, you're not probably listening to me any longer. You've already put it behind you, you've done it. And incidentally, this cost, it starts at like 20 bucks a month per computer, roughly. So it's affordable. Hmm. So if you're a small firm, you know, find an MSSP and just say, I need these five things and, and whatever else they recommend. If you're a little bit larger, let's do a security, a formal risk assessment. Let's really think through and find everything that we need to protect and understand the nature of your work and who your clients are. Because remember, it's about protecting all the stakeholders employees, mm -hmm. vendors even, um, of course, customers. It might be intellectual property. It might be entire cities or 
states or whatever you do work for. It could, you know, it could affect hundreds or thousands of people that we need to keep an eye on. And by doing a formal assessment, we'll uncover other vulnerabilities. Uh, but none of that happens until you recognize that it's not do-it-yourself. Going to the IT people is not the best path, mm -hmm. right? So hopefully that's, oh, I've opened up your mind to that. And in the business, it's called a managed security services provider, MSSP. Okay. That's what it's called. That's what Iron Tech is. Okay, very good. Well, Tom, thanks so much for being here and, and sharing all this great information with our listeners. If, if people want to reach out to you or, or do you have other resources that, that you would point people to to learn more if they want to go deeper and, and start uh, protecting themselves and their data a little bit more these days? Yeah, irontechsecurity.com. It's just like it sounds. Iron Tech Security, no hyphens, no, no fancy thing on the end. It's just .com, irontechsecurity.com. There are scads of resources there that can educate you further. There's a book that you can download. It's only 10 pages. Uh, that explains more detail the difference between IT and IS. Uh, there's a place there where you could schedule that five or ten minute meeting. It doesn't cost anything, and learn and just ask your questions. We didn't cover. I could have spoken two hours on this. Sure. Many many things. When we were off off camera, you mentioned something. Password managers. Okay, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Do you re ninety percent of the people reuse passwords and 60% of those people know they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And and it's you it, it really and truly my job day in and day out is getting people to take action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, because sure. the safer the safer everyone listening is, the safer we all are. Yeah. So yeah. Well, thanks so much and uh, appreciate you sharing all this and uh, wish you nothing but the best and hope that uh, all of us can take this a little bit more seriously and, and put some things in place to keep our, our data and information a little bit more secure. Thanks so much for being here, Tom. Appreciate it. No. My pleasure. Everybody stay vigilant. I really hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and questions. You can go to www.engineeringmanagementinstitute.org where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in the episode as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books that we mentioned. And don't forget to check out any upcoming live webinars also at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org. Additionally, for any engineers who are struggling and need help taking the next career step, I've created some free training resources with an opportunity to join a more intensive program called the Engineering Career Accelerator. You can find more information at engineeringcareeraccelerator.com. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering endeavors.